Congratulations to the Adelaide Football Club's first Premiership captain. And obviously did it uh, back to back. 272 games for Bix. So he was captain for four seasons and the first two of them were obviously premierships and no one had done that since the 50s with Melbourne. So it was uh, a remarkable time. We talked about Tyson with uh, being voted MVP by the members three times. Well, Bix is a, a three-time best team man and I think that really epitomises who he is as a player. We heard before about being number 52 on the list and Bix, I don't even think you had a contract once the season started. You had to wait until a couple of days before your first game. But congratulations, mate. You're a huge part of this footy club and I'm sure there's some people you'd like to acknowledge. Thanks, Soda. Yeah, I thought it was a bit rich, Nigel, complaining about the eight grand. I didn't get a cent, so... Um, <clears throat> um, firstly, I just want to um, talk a little bit about the other inductees. All I can hear on my head is Rue saying, don't cry, Bix, you weak bastard. But um, it's going to be tough for me, so sorry, Rue. Um, I don't think any player... Well, we start with Chris McDermott, and um, I don't think any player contributed more... Uh, in setting up the club than Chris. Um, he, was, he was someone who, when I walked into the club, a bit like Tyson just explained, I, um, I had a bit of that imposter syndrome where I wondered if I'd belong or if I was good enough to be there. And um, he was the person who, um, who made me believe that I was good enough. So um, to Chris... Um, I think you're over here somewhere. You've been a great person for me. Uh, you united us as a group. You, you, um, uh, I looked at you and I thought, if Chris can do it, I can do it. You made me, yeah, you just made me feel like it was um, that anyone could achieve what they wanted to achieve. And, and, and when I look back now on my career, I took so much from you in terms of I tried to when I was a leader, care about people and make them feel like they belonged and that they had real value in the organisation. So um, you've had an enormous impact on my life. Um, Nigel uh, is just such a remarkable person. Like, uh, it's, qu it's quite funny how our careers have sort of run in parallel. I arrived just after Nigel started at South Adelaide. Nigel started in 1988. I started in 1989. Um, there's probably never been two people more different uh, and yet we've just enjoyed being together and it's a bit of yin and yang I guess and I was always someone who followed the rules and I'm such a conformist and Nigel was just the opposite he just didn't follow the rules he questioned everything and and um, I just think it's so great that uh, and I'm sure Reedy's proud that the two boys from South Adelaide uh, in those years where we weren't a great team and we had to work really hard for everything end up being the captain and the vice captain of the uh, the Crows first premiership team so um so Nigel was awesome mate about 15 years together uh Tyson um you, everything Rue said about uh consistency and and reliability and and just someone you could trust, that was Tyson. And, and there's not many players I admire more uh, of the guys that I played with, of what he was able to achieve. And, and, and Rue pretty much summed up what I was thinking when he said, it, it's just not good enough to say he was a really consistent player. He was a star. Um, you know, this club has been blessed in terms of 300-game um, players. We've got four 300-game players and have had, you know, in 20 years of existence almost when... Um, a couple of years back, I think it might have been David Neitz more recently and, and uh, Nathan Jones at Melbourne. Melbourne have been around for 130 years and they've got three players. So to play 300 games, you have to be, you know, you're, you're almost 0.001% of the players that play. So Tyson, um, we had some great times together. I know you unfortunately had to share a room with me in Ireland when we, when we represented Australia and that wasn't much fun for you. But um, I'm not sure where you are as well, but I just I love... Uh, sharing my career with you, so congratulations, Tyson. Um, thank you to the Adelaide Football Club. I know all the guys have stood up here, and it's um, it's such a humbling event uh, to be recognised in this way. As Nigel said, I feel it's a bit harsh being coming on last because everyone said everything that you've already thought, and um, you know, Nigel talked about how he felt like he got more from the club. Than, than they gave him and, and I 
almost feel that as well. I'm not almost, I definitely feel that as well, where I was the, the net benefactor. And that uh, it's been one of the reasons that, that I just wish we could keep giving back to the club because it is a, um, it's been unbelievable the opportunities that it, that it gives you and, and allows you to do for the rest of your life. And playing elite sport is such a selfish pursuit and um, the world revolves around the actual athlete and what they do and where they have to be and when they have to do it. And, and for that, other people pay the price, like your family and your friends, and you miss out on a lot of stuff that you'd love to be doing. So, um, yeah, so I feel fortunate for that opportunity and I thank the club. And at the same time, uh, I want to really thank all the people that, that, that passed up on opportunities or that, that, that gave um, to me, that allowed me to be the person who stands up here tonight and they sit, sort of sit down there and, and I guess have been a lot of the people that have sort of endured the hardship. It doesn't seem really fair. So, um, so thank you to all those people. And, and it sort of starts, I guess, with your mum and dad. And um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Rue. <laughs> um, you know, they've been <clears throat> amazing people. And um, we, uh, Chris spoke about his mum and dad and, and the impression that they um, that they have on you and and uh, you know my whole existence has been a, around uh, trying to, to be the best version of myself so that I can sort of mirror what my mum and dad have done um, oh, they've always been my role model and in terms of footy clubs they've I don't have a memory where I haven't been involved in a footy club and some of my earliest memories are going to the footy as a four or five year old and go back to the rooms after the game, the club rooms, and um, mum and dad would be either working in the kitchen or doing stuff. And then about eight or nine o'clock, I'd go and get in my dressing gown and slippers. And it was either one of two things, get put to sleep under one of the tables or get put in the car to go to sleep. And then they'd keep drinking and about 11 o'clock, they'd all drive home. <laughs> now it's not really sort of uh, all that um, correct now to be doing that but it's like that was that was just what we did and then the next morning dad would go to church <laughs> which was go back to the club rooms the next morning and I would go with my brother and we would play eight ball and darts learn how to play crib and euchre and card games and it was just such a great uh, great upbringing so um uh, thank you to, to mum and dad. Um, they've been to just about every game. They drive down from Port Piri every week, so I, I know they've bought about three cars off Jarvis Toyota. I saw Robbie there before. He's pretty happy. They've done about a million kilometres. So, uh, and just a, a little bit about their humility. I reckon they, it was eight or nine years that they were season ticket holders before anyone that they sat with. You know how you sit in your same seat every week? before they realised that mum and dad were my mum and dad and the people around would say, Look, you've sat here for eight years and you haven't told us that your son is Mark Bickley. Um, that's the sort of humble people they are. So uh, thank you for, for everything, mum and dad. Um, to, uh, to my table that's here tonight, which is, it's a pretty crowded table. Thank you for the footy club for just putting a few more chairs on there. I've got... Um, all the kids are five beautiful children, Shane, Natasha, Alicia, Tyson and Xavier. Um, I promised I'd say they all, say they all their names. Uh, uh, the, like it's just been, uh, I guess you give me purpose, which is so important, so thank you. Uh, Tori, you've been outstanding as well, and I thank you uh, since coming into my life. It's been so, uh, so beautiful and... Um, Part of my journey with the Adelaide Football Club is as a coach and spent, I think it was six years coaching and you were very much a part of that and made many sacrifices, so I thank you for that. Um, to the players that I played with, it is, uh, as Rue said, it's so great to reminisce about it. Um, you think about, I started as a 21-year-old, I, I think I finished in my sort of early 30s and uh, it is the best years of your life and, you know, if... For the players that are still here, you know, if I could impart anything to you, it is that this moment is so fleeting for you and it is such a great time to 
in your life, you learn things, you, uh, you're so impressionable. Um, I, you know, I, I look at Rory and Tex and Daniel Talia and those guys, um, Tommy Lynch, and um, you've got married together, you've had kids together, you've done so much of those huge things in your life and you've shared them together. And, and I did that and it was just such a, it was such a great time for me. So, you know, just savour these moments. And, um, you know, while success and premierships are fantastic and they really uh personify the the feelings it's it's still those relationships that you make when you're playing that that endure and um there's so many great friends that i have that that didn't play premierships but it doesn't matter because we just we shared so much together so if i had a message for the players it's it's savor every moment um yeah and just don't leave any stone unturned as tyson said he talked about how it can really change quickly and, and how his career just exploded once he started to get things in line. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I think we all um, have marvelled at different times this year of some of the great performances, particularly against Geelong and Melbourne and some of those teams. We just we, we hope that that's a preview of what's to come in the coming years. Uh, we've had a lot of people talk about the staff and the volunteers of the Adelaide Footy Club and um, you know, I just want to reiterate everything they've said. They are the, like the, the engine room, the pump, that, that just keeps the place going and there's been a lot of names thrown around and, and, and I concur enormously with all those but Vinnie Del Bono is another one that hasn't been mentioned yet and um, been there forever <laughs> and just exemplifies everything about the footy club which is great um, and it's not just the staff that are there, it's board members, it's, uh, it's footy managers, it's media people, it's all those people that, that work enormous hours and um, it reminded me of a story. I heard this story is a couple of years old um, about Neil Armstrong. In 2019, in July, it was the, um, the 50 year anniversary of man landing on the moon. And Neil Armstrong, uh, you know, they camped out the front of his house and he came out and he spoke about it. And what he talked about was that he was the one that was the front man for all that. And he took you know, whenever anyone asks about man walking on the moon, it's always Neil Armstrong. And he was at pains to point out about all the other people that made it possible. And, you know, Buzz Aldrin was the second. And there was a third guy who orbited the moon while those guys were on there hitting golf balls and stuff. His name was Michael Collins. And there was 400 engineers that, that were at Cape Canaveral that, that made it possible for them to get up there and then get back again, and including a person who was a mathematician who had to come up with the calculation to work out the angle at which they had to re-enter back into the Earth's atmosphere. And if it was out by 1%, they would burn up on re-entry. And he just talked about everyone played their role and without everyone playing their role, that, they, that no one could achieve greatness. And they all played their role and yet he was the one that got to stand up and, and accept all the accolades. And, and, and that story really rings true with me for, and not so much just me, but but every player that gets to play, every player that runs out on the oval and, and enjoys the, the atmosphere, enjoys the accolades when they have a win and the, the camaraderie, they do that on the back of all the people that, that make it possible, that, that volunteer, um, that, that work at the club, that put in the extra hours, that do all those things. So I just think that's such a relevant story that, um, you know, I feel like Neil Armstrong and I feel like there's so many people that have made this possible. So I wanted to share that. To the members and the fans, um, they make the game. I mentioned about the atmosphere. For the people that have played a game of AFL footy at, at Adelaide Oval or at Footy Park or at the MCG, it is, it is just electrifying. The, the feeling you get, the adrenaline that surges through your veins, and it only happens because of the crowd and, and the way they are invested in their club. And, um, and that is such a pleasure and it's such an honour to be able to do that. So to all those people, and there's still people now that, that stop me in the street all the time and talk about, I was at the MCG in 1997 or, or they recount times when we played and, and um, you know, and what is it? You know, it's, it's decades later. So that is a pleasure that, that endures for me uh, onwards and onwards and I'm so grateful for that and without fans and without... Members, we don't have a game. So uh, to all those people, and particularly if they're sitting at home in front of their computer and they're watching now, we're thinking of you and, um, and we're appreciating it. And finally, my 
my greatest competitor was my older brother who passed away 18 months ago. When I think back about growing up, um, my memories are of us playing footy together, playing cricket together, um, doing everything together. And he was always better than me because he was bigger, that's all. Um, but um, it just made me strive to, uh, to be like him, to keep up with him, to be better than him. Um, and for 10 years, we just punched the shit out of each other and, and played and competed. And um, I have no doubt in my mind um, that, that my greatest asset was I was a competitor and I hated losing and, uh, and I never accepted it. And it was always because of the, that 10 years of just being with my brother and playing every night. So... Um, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of um, him tonight and, and his wife and daughter are with us. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry that got a little bit heavy. Um, tonight's an, uh, is about a celebration. As I said, Rue, I'm, I'm freaking sorry, mate. I just, I've always had trouble keeping my emotions in check. Um, I thank Mum for that, but uh, you know, I've, I just happened to be talking to to Dipper. I ran into Robert Dipper at Amenico about a month and a half ago, and um, somehow we got talking. And he talked about when he was a 16-year-old uh, lad, he bowled into uh, Hawthorne, and Peter Crimmins was the captain at the time. And on the wall, um, there was a, a, a slogan or a logo, and it said. Um, if you embrace the club, the club will embrace you. And he said, Peter Crimmins, when I walked in, he pointed at that on the wall and he said, there's never a truer word being spoken about Hawthorne. And he said, I did that. And, um, and instantly I thought of, of my experience at the Adelaide Footy Club and I just enjoyed every second of my time here. I embraced it wholeheartedly and I feel like the club's embraced me. So thank you very much. Congratulations to Mark Bickley. Beautiful words too, mate. Um, I'll give you a moment to uh, catch your breath. Take a step up there. Malcolm Blight, could you please put your hands together for the dual premiership coach? And we'll get Malcolm to, to come up here. Now, Bix, I'm just tipping that we, we heard about Graham and Chris McDermott earlier. I'm tipping the plot he never got a call in the middle of the night to come and drag you out of a disco. <laughs> Don't seem like the sort of guy. No. Um, thank you very much, Malcolm. Um, and, and it is a bloody big thrill for me to have Malcolm sitting next to me. I grew up as a kid and Malcolm was my idol and it's funny how the world works. Um, but one of the stories I can remember when Malcolm asked me if I, was, if I wanted to be the captain... Um, we went for a walk around the Torrens, and, um, and I thought this is a bit interesting, but uh, I was sort of really hoping that he was going to ask me that. And then we went through a lot of the pre-season, and I hadn't really had a lot you know, of meetings with Malcolm. So my previous experience had been that the captains had met a bit with the coach. Yep. And so I thought, oh, I'd better go in and say to Malcolm, I said, do you and I need to be meeting a bit more, you know, like discussing what we're doing here? Uh, and Malcolm said, I'll tell you what, if I decide that you and I need a meeting, you'll be the first bloke to know. So, <laughs> but then he went on to say, and this stuck with me for a long time, he said, uh, if you do nothing else but set a really good example on the training track and, be, uh, and play really good footy and set a really good example when we play games, he said, I'll take that and you need to do no more. So um, that was sort of like my base level, and that's what I sort of endeavoured to do. Blighty, thanks for joining us, because it is golf day today, I believe, isn't it? <laughs> Jesus, some stories. Um, yeah, well, Thursday was. No, yeah. hang on, hang on, just a second. Uh, now, sorry, Mark, I'll let you get going, mate. No, no, no. Just a second. What actually happened was, I did have Thursday off, but everybody else did. 
it was the day the whole club, all the trainers, the staff, everybody. I actually started it. The Players Association picked it up a few years later and everyone got the day off. Because right. otherwise everyone was. I mean, it, you need some downtime. Yep. So Thursday and all the players could go out with their wives, girlfriends, whatever, and just have a family day, do whatever they wanted to do. So I actually started it. Boy, it's another great landmark you've been involved with. Interesting to see that all of the players would go off for their wives and girlfriends and you go and play golf. But anyway, that's something different. Um, bloody, uh, why Mark Bickley as captain? Why did you choose him as your captain? Yeah, I, the, the story, um, someone picked him out before me. Um, if there was a leadership group and that Mark would have been in it. Yep. It, it came about a, a lot of years ago. Uh, I was in the Savings Bank of South Australia and where there was a guy called Bob Boston who played for Port Adelaide and Westies. And most, when I was in Melbourne, most spring carnivals, they'd come over with a group and he was in the bank at Port Pirie. In that group yep. was a Mr Bickley, Mark's father. So when John Reid started coaching South Adelaide after I'd been with him at Woodville, you just started taking an eye, uh, keeping an eye, and John did obviously, mm. um, knew him from that way. So I started taking a bit of an interest in what Mark was doing yep. and the way he operated and the way he played. So it was really, I suppose, a 25-year association from before then that started the interest in Mark Bickley. Yeah. Did he ever give you any grief? Because he seemed like a... Well, because you always reminded me of everyone watching you were like a goody two-shoes. And I mean that in a nice way because you were always such, like you were saying, you were conformist, but you were... A great leader, you're a good bloke, you're a, you know, a good citizen. You weren't a loose, crazy cat. Well, look, I think you didn't watch all that closely. Some of the opposition players mightn't say that. Um, I, look, I've always felt like I sort of floated close to the line in, to, yeah. in regards to the rules. And, and when you get close, sometimes you step over and, and that happened once or twice. But like in the end, I didn't have the luxury of... of um, stuffing up or like I was literally felt like every day of my life I was on the borderline yeah. and so you know I had no qualms about doing everything right or trying to be the best or trying to do everything that would give me the best opportunity because I didn't have much margin for error to be quite fair. Is he being modest? Yeah I think he is. I think I said to him I haven't seen any poor 200 game players mm. um, at the level only 270 odd sort of that's knocking on the door as you mentioned of 300 which is massive. Um, always performed, probably always, not always in the best players, but nearly always in the best players. And the thing I think anybody that's ever coached or watched football, players that play to their max every time, it's bloody hard to do. But Mark was one of those players, and like you mentioned Tyson earlier, and Nigel, I mean, they're up here for a reason. They were really good players. I mean, they had some class. Mark took himself down a bit, but he actually, do you see that 52 metre goal he kicked? It was the only one he ever did, but it was a bloody great kick. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> it's in the archives. I've got that at home. It's on the wall. <laughs> I, I, I always wondered, um, you know, we, we, obviously growing up in Piri, but the thing everyone forgets, I mean, you won the Madigan medal, you know, which is right up there in for that league at 19 years of age. I mean, he was playing against gorillas. Yeah. So, so he, I mean, the, the, everyone talks about, you know, did this or that or whatever, but he was actually a really good player. When he, when he got going, he was a beauty. As Mark being your captain, did you have to use him in particular ways to set the example for the team? Yeah, I think, um, I, hopefully I, I set Mark up, but if, if there was an issue that I just wanted to get, I'd always go to the captain first. Yeah. So in a team meeting, and Nigel and him would have the first say, that's why they're there. I just reckon senior players dictate around the club. I don't reckon you need six or seven. That's too many. I don't get why they do that now. Mm. But certainly the captain and vice captain were pretty important in my eyes to actually bounce stuff off them first. Then if they agreed with it, then I'd bring it up in a meeting and those guys, guys would go with it. Now, if yeah. they disagreed, well, I just left them out of the meeting. Yeah. <laughs> can, can, I, no, can, can, I, can I actually share one story that scared the shit out of me was when... Is in 1997, we played the West Coast Eagles in our first final. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the passing of uh, Princess Diana, mm. uh, the game was rolled over from Saturday into Sunday. So Sunday turns out to be a day much like today where it was a howling gale blowing. And so we get to the game and it's like, oh, this is big. And we're, you know, we've been waiting 36 hours for this game. And there's a 
howling wind blowing. And Malcolm says, I've had a bit of an idea. I wouldn't mind just sort of bouncing this off you. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. And he said, I'm thinking that um, if we win the toss, mm. why don't we kick against the breeze? What do you think? Mm. And I'm, you know, like, um, yeah, well, look, I guess I'm open to the idea. You know, like, you know, and I asked well, why, and, and Malcolm sort of explained, well, look, we've waited 36 hours for this. Yep. It's going to be you know, players sort of fumbly and jumpy and, and, and maybe it'll be a bit scrappy early. So let's get the edge off the game. And in the second quarter, mm. then maybe we might be able to, to sort of take advantage of the wind. So I'm saying, oh, yeah, well, look, I guess that makes sense. And I'm hardly going to question Malcolm. And so, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, we'll do that. And look, I've never walked to the centre square wanting to lose the toss more in my life. You know, you see what happened with Trent Koch and, you know, for yes. Richmond, yeah. So we walk up there and, and um, we're playing West Coast and, and they call and they win the toss. Mm. And I'm thinking, <laughs> hallelujah. They kick with the breeze. Guess what the score was at quarter time? West Coast about one goal, Crows four goals. Yeah, you kicked four four, didn't you, you guys, in that game? And that set up the So win. there you go. No, can I can I also say, why do you tell that story so wrong? <laughs> What's your version? No, the first Nigel Smart was in the room. There's only a captain and vice captain. And normally what I would do yep. would burn a quarter. You know, mm. that particular year we had the least points kicked against us, mainly because we played a lot of night footy, played a lot of slippery footy. But also, when the opposition had the win, I'd defend one side. So all the bikes would kick it back one side. Yep. So you just sort of burn the quarter. Yep. This is the attacking coach who becomes Stanford. And just tire them and out. Just tire them out and then the just and really frustrate them. And we right. did it a lot. We did a yep. lot of scores, low scores. Anyhow, at that final, I got the two boys in and said, the wind was going. I said, you know what? We're not going to burn the quarter this time. I'm going to go for it. So you just missed out a sentence, Mark. The, the, yeah. The result was the same, but you just missed the sentence. And I was talking to Nigel Maybe earlier. I was still sort of picking myself up when you said, let's kick against the breeze. <laughs> no, 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 no. I said, no, we're going to go for it against the breeze. Jeez, they miss such stories. <laughs> um, Blighty, I've asked everyone that sat in that position where you have tonight about the guy that they are talking about. Um, he's obviously a captain. First thing you think of when you think of Mark Bickley, what is it? Yeah, I, I mean... <laughs> It was courageous. It was interesting what you said about Chris McDermott. I mean, played very much like Chris too, in in Chris's heyday. So that was that was good. I mean, he he was really he was actually a fairly aggressive player, Mark. Mm. He, he was. I, I, most people don't probably realise that, but he was a very aggressive around the ball. There were always casualties, uh, which you know, fairly in those days. I mean, we're not talking now. Um, mm. So I always found him to be an aggressive player. Always played, tried his guts out, always did his best. And one of the great things in that story that uh, Tyson talked about too was that because I've been involved somewhere else, on grand final day, as it turned out, if, you be, if your best midfielders don't play well, you lose. Yep. So to actually get six or seven of them to all play half back and on the ball was very much part of the plan that we started with when I first walked into place. Yep. And it worked out beautifully. You know, mm. Rashudo, Bickley, Goodwin. Johnson, Edwards, Jarman, even. You know, I mean, you could go on and on and on yeah. because we had that flexibility in the team. And, and that, it's all right for me to come up with that. But you know what's got to happen? The players have to act it out. So all a coach does is actually try to paint a picture where the player sits in and then they try and act out what you want them to do. But it's all, all about the players doing their role. Bix, is the proudest moment holding the cups up in those times or was it something that perhaps doesn't appear as significant to people from the outside. Was there, was there something else that really epitomises your time at the footy club? Uh, look, the relationships are important, but in, in terms of trying to put it into to one moment, um, the premierships are because it's what we play for. And, and I, can have this, I can have a vivid memory in my head of thinking at about one minute to go and Jars had just kicked his fifth goal perhaps for the quarter and, and it's like you're thinking... I'm not going to be one of those guys that retires without winning a flag. And, and literally for a, for a footballer, that is the, is the panacea. It's like a weight that gets lifted off your shoulders. And, and a lot of that is relief initially, but then it's, it's just, um, you know, excitement. But uh, the, the culmination, I think, and, and that it, it's sort of put into one sort of finite moment, but it's, it's literally how many people start something 
and then get to be there at the end when they reach the pinnacle. And, and if you look through history, there's so many people that are casualties along the way before you get to where you want to get to. So for, for Jamo and for Pitto and Nigel and, and so many of those guys that were there at the very beginning and to be able to see it through and be there at the end when you achieve something, that that is really, really special. So that's probably the thing that um, that I take away from it most. And... and while I still got the mic, uh, you know, Nigel did mention about Malcolm and um, and him sort of what he brought to the club. What Malcolm said before about the players have to act it out, but they also you have to have that person who steers the ship. And uh, and what I've found, you know, I played for probably 15 or 16 years and coached for five or six, and it's really interesting that you know Malcolm was involved for three of those years, um, and yet so much of my philosophy around footy. Is, uh, is aligned more to Malcolm than any other coach. So, you know, that's the impression that he left on me as a person. And, um, and you know, we've stayed in touch and I love uh, Malcolm's friendship. And so, yeah, like to, for, you know how things, the planets align? The planets have to align to win premierships. You need so much to go right. And I actually think in the club's history, there's been probably two or three times where there's been a better team and there's been... Um, better opportunities to win flags but the planets just didn't align all those two years we had things that went our way we had an ounce of luck but we also had a team that was ready to sort of take that luck and part of that was Malcolm agreeing to come back and um yeah it's just been uh you know that that timing of everything's just just worked really well probably uh the biggest memory is uh after the grand final you go on the dais after and they give you the cup the first one, my, yeah, oh, yeah. I was uh, in the wrong yeah, spot. I ruined the photo. Yeah, yeah. I, ruined, I ruined Mark's photo. But yeah. And Mark said to me, well, I said, I've never done it before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've never done it before. Well, you saw, we've seen it all through the night. Yeah. yeah. The first one, you've just got yeah. the hand across your face. Yeah. It was lucky you got the second chance, though, the next year. Yeah, it wouldn't have happened otherwise. <laughs> no. It, it, no. I, I, just one other thing that, uh, that I can remember about Malcolm and me being a, more to the goody two shoes. Um, uh, I don't mean that disrespect. No, no, no. no I'm, I'm, I'm just going to sort of elaborate on exactly yeah. that's how I am because Malcolm in 97 said, if I ever hear, this is after we won the prelim final, he said, the most important thing this week, there's going to be so much attention and you can play the game before you actually get out on the field. The really, the most important thing is really about the start and how well we start and settle down into the game. So if I hear one person talk about the result, about winning, about flags, he said, fair dinkum, I'll kick him fair up the ass." Yeah. So... True to my word, you know, did every, all of that, didn't think too far ahead and then we won and then everyone's got all their family and friends back in the change rooms and mums and dads and like there was literally no one of me because I hadn't organised anything because I was <laughs> literally hadn't allowed myself to think what might happen if we had a one. And so um, so back that was before mobile yeah. phones, so I didn't see mum and dad till about the Wednesday, I reckon. They were over at the game, but I just had no idea where they were. Uh, so, so getting back in 98 was yeah. just, it was like such a gift because I just thought, you know what, Let's just dream a bit. And I had everyone yeah. to be able to be there. And we had a table at the grand final dinner afterwards. And it was just one of the, the greatest nights of my life, being able to, to share that moment with all those people that w we were close to. So, um, yeah, so thankfully, uh, I look, true to my word, I didn't think about it, but 98 was a godsend. Yeah. Um, a lot of people ask me, what's Mark Bickley like? And I, I don't do this little radio show now. And what I've said is that probably... Couldn't have been a better captain at the mm. time. It was a bit like Chris with Graham, you know. Yep. He just looked obvious. But I found that Mark was a no-excuse player, a no-excuse person. And I think if you're ever going to be anything, if you, I just love no excuses. Mm. Whether you play well, poor or indifferent, don't make the excuse, go and do the work. There is no substitute for it. And I've said this a lot for most of my life. I've never seen a boy or a girl in the, in the day saying, but let's take the boys... I've never seen someone come out the womb kick a footy. Mm. Just think about it. It is all learnt behaviour. And I've never seen anyone run a marathon that's never done any practice because they'll die. The most of it is actually getting fit, getting hard and doing the work. We've all born tall, short, fat, stout, whatever. But if you don't do the work and put in the effort and make no excuses for what you end up with, that's why Mark Bickley was captain of the club. 
I think you summed him up beautifully then, Bordy. <laughs> Bix, congratulations. Don't go anywhere. I want you to stay here because we're going to get all the inductees here, mate. And it just sounds like you had the opportunity along with Blighty, you all a bunch of Neil Armstrongs, a whole lot of you. <laughs> so congratulations. And I think tonight we've seen just how important the football club is and the connection of the football club for not just the, the four guys that have been inducted, but for everyone else that's come up here as well and all the other players there. And I think when you look at it, Bix, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of current listed players in the, in the girls' side and the men's side that uh, have an opportunity to all become maybe Neil Armstrong's as well. So it's a, a great chance for the club now to take those steps forward. So well done to Bix. Congratulations, Blighty. Great to have you up here. Hello, as always. Hi.